Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. This week we've got Shane Moore with us. Shane is on Twitter as the at the Dorky Shane. Um, delighted to have you with us. Uh, topic this week is really interesting because uh, we've not really covered mental health issues and PTSD in particular before on Access Chat, and it's a really important issue to cover. You've been tremendously successful um, in your various careers. You've been mm -hmm. a policeman, a uh, professional sports person, and, and now uh, a multiple best-selling author and writer and everything else. So uh, it's quite a portfolio of skills you've got. So um, tell us a little bit, of it, a bit more about yourself. Okay. Well, you want me to start from the very beginning or it, from the end of my law enforcement career or from when I was stabbed? Um, where do you want me to start? Wherever you wish. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, what, what, whatever makes sense to you. All right. Well, I'm 50% uh, I'm Dutch and 50% Femina Little Shell. So I'm, I'm half Native American and half Dutch. My father and brothers live on the reservation out there in, in Montana. And um, I grew up um, um, in a fairly rough home, um, lots of drugs. Um, my first was abused when I was three. And uh, I ran away from home at age 14. And I didn't have, I was too young to really get a job. So I bounced around from friends' houses uh, a lot, and if I didn't have a friend's house to stay in or they began to get suspicious, um, I slept in unlocked vehicles. Um, there was a place in, uh, that had a lot of farm trucks that would park there, and, and they had uh, uh, bench seats instead of bucket seats, and they never had working dome lights. So I could sneak in. They were always unlocked, and I could sleep there. Um, at 15, um, I got my first job, but I wasn't 16, so here in, in, uh, in Illinois, you had at that time you had to have a workers permit and you were only permitted to work 20 hours. So the principal signed off on it that my grades were good enough. So I actually got uh, Xerox. It is kind of to date myself is back when Xerox was a thing, and I whited out all the information from the employer and Xeroxed it. And then so I had two copies signed by the principals. Then I went in and then refill out the employer uh, information and I worked two jobs and I got a job at Harmon's IGA and the other job was at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then I worked those, and my grandmother, um, I wasn't old enough to sign a lease, so my grandmother had a trailer in her name, and I lived there um, for the most part through school. Occasionally, I'd bounce back and forth uh, back home, but it was very, um, you know, it, was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't a place I wanted to be considering um, the drugs and stuff like that. So I kind of went uh, back and forth. I had a very tumultuous uh, relationship with my father at best to describe, so it uh um, I did that until I was um, 17. I was accelerated in school. I was supposed to be really smart. Um, my grades didn't reflect that. But um, at the start of my senior year, I was 16. And then when I graduated, I was 17. And um, my science of paperwork got emancipated uh, from my parents and went into the U.S. Navy at 17. I did two years active duty, which was my enlistment period. I got out. I used the GI Bill and went to college. What was interesting is the GI Bill at that time really only provided me around four hundred dollars of income a month so um and the college that I, the community college i attended was not it was like 40 minutes away so for the first year and a half of my associate's degree i actually lived in my car and stuff in my car um, to get it done but eventually i got my um, college credits in and i started in uh, law enforcement okay wow so uh yes yeah. just, just the back stories um yeah fascinating and, and you really you know have to show tenacity to actually get to the point of getting a job but then you, you were a law officer and then you got stabbed and that had an impact on on your life that that changed sure. in fact it started um it started really my journey towards success okay. um september 10th 2004 i was a patrolman and we'd received a 911 hang up for a residence that we had been to frequently in the past and upon arrival, I had met with the wife, and she stated that her uh, husband, an over-the-road truck driver, um, had threatened to kill her, displayed uh, specifically threatened to slit her throat, displayed two knives, uh, both folding knives, described them. Uh, one was red, one was black. And then um, we got statements from her. And then when we went to get her to file charges, she decided that, that she wouldn't file charges. And it may sound dumb um, to people listening, but it's not that uncommon. Um, you know, if she files charges, her entire life is, is topsy-turned. 
um, she, you know, she left, her husband get arrested, they could get divorced, that she didn't have a job. And of course, I'm not advocating that those are reasons to stay in domestic violence, but it's not as easy and cut and dry as people think that it is. So this is why a lot of times um, women or men stay in, uh, the, uh, in these relationships. Of course, the male dynamic is different. They don't want to be labeled a sissy or a wimp. And so that dynamic is different, but it's not as cut and dry on, on why they don't file charges. Cool. Unfortunately, there really was nothing that we could do if she did not want to file charges, um, and the suspect was not on scene. Um, so we really couldn't get his uh, take on it. So I just advised her. I said, well, just lock your doors, and if you you know, if you have problems, again, just call 911 back. There's really not a lot, whole lot we can do at this point. Um, three minutes into September 11th, 2004, we received another 911 hang-up back at that residence. Um, when I responded, the, um, I pulled out in front, and the front door had been kicked in, and I could see the male suspect uh, dancing around the table um, with the female suspect on the other side. So he would go one way and she would go the other. Um, I jumped out of the car. I hit my uh, car horn the, uh, uh, you know, on the car um, to alert the suspect. That way, if he got to her before I got to him, he would have stabbed her. So I alerted him that I was present. He seen me and did exactly what I wanted him to do, which was flee. And he fled at uh, and I'd been to the residence before for other calls, so he went towards the kitchen, and I knew that there was a back door there. So I got out of my patrol car, uh, called a foot pursuit, and then I exited on foot and then circled around the house, back of the house. As I was crossing the house, he was he burst out the back door and fled uh, back towards a really dark kind of a wooded area um, of the house. Um, I, now, I played also 12 seasons of AAA semi-pro football, which is here in America, American football, you know, it's uh, – it's uh, not soccer. It's um, you know, it's foot. I don't know how way to describe it. It's like no, football. No, it's, okay. it's real football. That's what. Yeah, we're there you go. Yes. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I was I was a, I was a younger man and I was in good shape and uh, I was running a, a four five nine forty at two hundred and thirty nine pounds. Um, I'm fairly bulky now, but I was even. I mean, I was at the height of my physical ability. So I pursued him on foot. Um, I caught him. And when I was running, he put his right hand in his pocket, and he, he I know you can't see on camera, but he did a little flick like this out of his pocket. And I thought that he was throwing drugs. Um, in law enforcement, there's a thing called complacency. Complacency is when you begin to um, accept your, that your job is a job, and you begin to lose the idea that it's dangerous. And instead, you focus less on your own safety and more on apprehension. And that's what I did. I, I had completely forgot. Um, in my mind, in the height of the pursuit that he was, uh, could possibly be armed. And instead my focus was apprehension. So I thought he was throwing drugs. Um, so he went like that with his right hand as I began to close because I was very fast. He reached his left hand in his pocket and I tackled him just at that moment. Um, what really was happening is he had, um, in our previous report, she had described two lock blade knives. So really what he had done was he wasn't, um, throwing drugs, but rather trying to flip open the knife as he was running. But he dropped it because he had one in each pocket. So he went to his left hand with the other one to pull it out, and that's when I tackled him. Um, we were hit. My momentum carried me. I don't remember exactly how the positioning got to where it was, but it ended up where I was trying to force him to his back, and he was facing me. And he reached. He had gotten the knife out of his left hand, and I didn't see it as a pitch black. And he stabbed me directly above my uh, duty gun, my weapon, my gun. And uh, I felt a slight pinch, and um, I thought that he was reaching for my duty weapon. So I took both hands, and I trapped him on his hand. And when I turned it over, so it had been his left hand, so I turned it over, his hand was like this. And then the knife fell, and I saw a bunch of blood. And then, of course, then the fight was on. And I commenced in punching and, and snarling and doing all the, you know, oh, oh, the oh, in law enforcement, we call it the, well, it's called the old oh, craps. I won't say the other. Um, but... <laughs> It's the, you know, oh, crap, and we're fighting, and um, oh, because of my physical ability, I was able to subdue him relatively quickly and efficiently, I handcuffed him, and then the other officers were arriving on scene and then got to my location. What was interesting was up until the point at which I saw the, the, the knife, um, it was fairly clear, uh, but my recollection at that point, uh, my tunnel vision came in and my focus was only on uh, exactly what was going on. I knew nothing of my other surroundings. Um, and it wasn't until that the other officers actually got him back into the squad car that I realized that, um, you know, I may have an injury here, uh, you know, exactly what's going on. Now, I was fortunate the knife actually did not penetrate far past my vest. 
So my vest stopped uh, pretty much all of it. Um, I, uh, the, the slight prick I felt was what had, what had penetrated, but there was a cut in my shirt. And um, so we got him handcuffed, and it wasn't until we got back to the police department. We had to call an ambulance because uh, during uh, my use of force, he, saw, he was injured uh, pretty severely. And um, I didn't shoot him or anything. And, and a lot of the officers wondered why I didn't transition to lethal force. I was justified. Um, but sometimes when you're in hands-on, in order to transition to a greater level of force, I would have had to disengage and then free the control. So I would have to go back neutral because I, I was stronger. I had more control. So the transition to my sidearm, I would have to lose control to then transition to a higher to a higher level of force. And the current level of force, while um, wasn't as high as I could have used, it was sufficient. So that was all that I needed to do. Um, turns out um, through my strikes, um, he got uh, blood on the brain, spent 12 days in a coma. And then when he awoke, he later escaped from the hospital. That's a whole other that's a whole other story. Um, I didn't have any problems initially. The first couple of days I was fine. Um, the department uh, said, you know, you need any counseling or anything like that. And um, that's frowned upon in the, in the street, not by your department, but on the street. You're, you know, you're, you're supposed to be a tough guy. You're supposed to be able to handle these problems. And I really didn't – it didn't seem to be a problem. And the more shifts I worked, uh, my hypervigilance was through the roof. Um, I was uh, – and the hypervigilance for law enforcement officers is common anyways. Mine was even extremely on alert. And that stress over a course of a week – built up until I began having night terrors. So what happened is I would be fine during the day. I was hyper vigilant, so I watched everybody's hands, even off duty, even more than I normally would. But at night, um, nightmares. Every time I fell asleep, there was a nightmare. Um, if, it's difficult to explain how that begins to wear on you because um, and, um, it's, it's like going, it's like when you go to bed, you know you're going to go in a haunted house over and over and over and over. Um, I was a single parent at the time. I had custody of my son. It's another long story on how that a man got custody of his child in America, but um, it was really challenging. So what I would do when I would get off work on the midnight shift, I would consume a beer. So if I drank one beer, it would calm me down, and I still have the night terrors, but the anxiety of those nightmares didn't exist because the beer kind of numbs those um, senses. Well, one beer became two, became four, and at that point I said, I, I'm not going to become a TV cliché. I must find another method of coping. Uh, my two methods of coping that I chose, one was the gym. I trained ever super hard in the gym. Um, I lived, ate, and slept policing. I became the TV show cliche. Um, I studied everything. I took every training class. I learned everything on law. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I was really empowering myself. I was trying to uh, make myself stronger, tougher, more efficient. Um, to protect myself from the very realization that I, the, the mortality and the dangerousness of the job. Um, another friend of mine, she had suggested that I write. She says, when I'm feeling bad, I write poems. Um, as a police officer, you don't, you're a big tough guy. I'm not going to write poetry. Are you kidding me? Uh, but I was also a nerd, so I decided to write um, a fantasy story. And you really can't get much farther removed from law enforcement than dragons and elves and, and you know wizards and stuff. So I started writing um, my first novel. Um, and every time I would get off shift to wind down instead of consuming alcoholic beverage, I instead would write three to 4,000 words. It didn't take long to write a massively large uh, novel. And uh, that, that began the writing. Um, everything was going fairly fine. My method of coping was working. It was actually constructive and productive. I still had night terrors pretty frequently. Um, but I had, um, oddly enough, I actually even begun to become accustomed to them. Um, I had modified my bedroom in such a manner that when I would have a night terror, I was safe. I didn't run into things when I would leap out of the bed. Um, I had made my bedroom had a complex. I created a, a sliding lock on my bedroom door. So in the event that my night terror or in confusion, I tried to leave my bedroom uh, hastily. It was, uh, I was incapable of doing that. Um, and um, so things were going well. Uh, I got officer of the year. I earned a life-saving medal. I earned a, um, uh, another award for life-saving um, and then got promoted to detective. And in 2006, a little over a year later, um, I had responded to another call where a guy was suicidal um, and then tried to kill me. Um, make a long story short, I nearly lost that physical confrontation. Um, I was nearly choked unconscious, um, nearly lost my weapon. And uh, at that point, then everything crashed in. Uh, I, my All the, this, the uh, methods of coping I had taken in order to secure um, my safety failed. 
I was, no matter what I tried or did, or it was very obvious that I was mortal and could be, you know, there was, it was very big. It's a very powerless feeling. And, um, I knew at that point I must get out of law enforcement. There, there was no, no, there was no, I had to get out. Um, I did, you know, when you wake up every morning and you're strapping your boots on and you say, am I going to be killed today? Um, and that's a very real thought and concern of every law enforcement officer um, in, in, in the country. Um, interestingly enough, you would expect in America that my, my confrontations for fear of my life will result in a firearm, and none of those, neither of my two occasions, involved a firearm at all. Um, on the reverse side, because I had written a novel and it was, and it was sell, selling well, the media, and I was law enforcement, the media wanted to talk about it. It was very interesting to them. Our, our, the American media loves law enforcement. So whether good or bad, they love reporting on it. It's a great story. Um, it gets the clicks. It sells the advertisements, um, which is why now in law enforcement we have an anti, a fairly anti-police movement here in the U.S. Um, I attribute most of that to uh, media response. If you're re- it's, it's the new pit bull problem. Yep. Um, if you remember 10 years ago, pit bulls were all vicious killers, even though pit bulls never led a bite statistic. Um, in fact, the most common bite leader usually was um, a Labrador retriever or the toy dogs that led bite statistics. So the media media uh, sensationalizes what will sell. Not to get sidetracked on a political tangent there, but um, so I was, I was, the media loved me. I did well. I sold well. And then in 2008, I decided to uh, hang up uh, my career for good. Um, I did 11 and three quarter years. I had earned um, officer of the year, a life saving medal, an award for life saving for another incident, and I completely abandoned it and plunged into uh, self employed and went full time writer. And I've never looked back. Wow, what an amazing story! What an amazing story! Yeah, I'm 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 in awe. Um, I can relate to some of the stuff around being physically attacked. Because when I was in my early 20s, I was working in a, in a liquor store and I refused to serve some people and I got tripped up and they smashed a, a litre and a half bottle of wine over my head, uh-huh. completely cracked it open. And, Touched you a bunch too, I'm sure. Uh, and, and even to this day, I get tiny little grains of glass out of my skull sometimes, mm-hmm. wow. 20 years later. Um, and, and yeah, you don't sleep, but I mean, I nowhere near as traumatized as, as you, but I, I, I can relate. Um, and, but you turned it into such a, a, a positive thing. You could have spiraled downward. So, Oh, don't, don't think there weren't downward spirals. Oh, there were. No, 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 but it could have been, it could have been terminal. Yeah. yeah. And, sure. and instead you, you recognized that, that point. And, and so what was it that, that, that gave you the strength to, to, to turn yourself around. I, honestly, it was. Um, I think my desire for entertainment. I didn't. A lot of the times, this uh, the, the things I were doing was more. I love having fun. Um, growing up the way I did, um, I really never grew up in a way. Um, I love. I'll be goofy. I'll dance and skip in public. I don't care. And it's it's funny like this giant 240 pound man goofing with a mohawk. You know, goofing off and. And saying dorky stuff, and I'm not, I'm not really overly concerned with anyone's opinions. I want to have fun, and in my life at that moment was not fun. There was nothing fun about it. So, an attempt to recapture fun, which I love having, um, I unintentionally began to put myself on the path that led, you know, led to where we're at. Probably the out of all everything I encountered, the most challenging moment was after I ended law enforcement and I decided to go um, see a psychiatrist, uh, not because I believe that. Um, uh, you know, I had some sort of um, massive problem. It, it, it didn't really dawn on me. I was just going, you know, I knew something wasn't right. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to go and get deprogrammed. Um, I know how I was programmed um, to look at hands, to stand with my weapon side away, to keep my hands at the ready when talking with anyone. I knew what caused that, so I wanted to un- deprogram. And when I was talking with the, the counselor, he says, well, what do you want out of this? What are you trying to achieve? And I said, well, it's like The Matrix, right? Um, The movie The Matrix. Have you guys seen the film The Matrix? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Neo goes to Morpheus, and Morpheus offers him two pills. There's a red pill and a blue pill, right? I said, I want want the blue pill. I want to to deprogram. I want to walk into a gas station, and if some guy walks in with his hands in his pockets, I don't want to begin taking tactical movements to position myself at an advantage in the event he pulls a gun. 
I want to pay for my gas and get a soda and leave and be none the wiser um, that uh, of anything. And when <laughs> when that man told me there was no blue pill for me, it was really rough. Um, that was uh, that was probably the closest I was to suicide at that moment. Okay. But um, I don't know. It. Uh, I just I quit going. It felt as if I was just wasting my time. So instead, what I did focus is I went back to what I wanted to do, and that was fun. Um, how do I have fun? How do I do fun things? Uh, video games. Uh, I got World of Warcraft. Um, well, of course, I went through a divorce and all of this. Uh, imagine that. And uh, um, a part of that was my second attempt on my life involved a bed. And we had collapsed on the bed at a perpendicular angle with the bed. So um, the bed would rise up in a 45-degree angle because there was, like, no box spring. You ever seen the super soft beds? Yeah. Um, so there was no box spring. I couldn't – and he was on top of me choking me. I couldn't roll right. I couldn't roll left because I was rolling uphill on a mattress. So I just couldn't sleep in beds after 2006. Well, if you can't sleep in a bed with your spouse, that obviously – creates problems. Um, it wasn't, uh, I never abused her. I never, um, I did anything bad. I just distant, I became very distant and, and recluse and, and secluded. Um, so I was divorced in August, uh, early August of 2008. Um, and obviously when I quit being a, a cop income was challenging. Um, I was living on ramen noodles. I was uh, fishing for extra food if necessary. Um, you know, for meat and stuff like that. Um, if you go to my social media on my fan page on Facebook, you'll see pictures from that time period, some small catfish that uh, I didn't care how big they were. I kept them and ate them, you know, so we cleaned those up, anything that we could get. And it was just me and my son. Um, of course, on social media, I don't go into the full details on why that photo was there or significant. But um, so I went through a divorce and I started playing World of Warcraft. It was fun. It was um it was like writing, except for I didn't have to really write. I just wander around and fight monsters and um, immerse myself in a fictitious world that had goals and, and achievements and things that you could do um, outside. I could easily see why people got addicted and caused problems in their life. And um, at that point, uh, my writing was doing well and beginning to take off. Um, not so much in a monetary sense yet, but definitely in an exposure sense. People were hearing about me. Um, and, of course, that later translates into sales. I mean, I had made friends with Peter Mayhew, and of course, Peter is Chewbacca in Star Wars. And yeah. uh, I made friends with Peter and his wife, and Angie's an amazing person. Really, she, if it were not for Peter and Angie Mayhew, I probably would not have had success to the level at which I'm having it, only because the entertainment industry is so vastly different than um, any other career. Um, and I had no education, no college, no, it was bang, here I am. And Angie would teach me on th little things to do. Uh, things to say when I would mess up. If they were around, they would kick me and say, Angie would uh, kick me and say, don't do that. You know, this, that's not how you handle this. You know, this is the entertainment industry. It's different. This is how you, this is how you handle it. This is what you say. And um, uh, the learning curve is pretty narrow, but I learned it and made it. And, uh, um, you know, I'm doing pretty well. But um, I met my current wife. Uh, this back when MySpace was a big deal, so I can date myself. She had a uh, World of Warcraft background. And um, I felt uh, I felt jilted by my ex-wife, and I felt that um, um, you know there was uh, you know I felt that she abandoned me, you know, a sickness or in health, and I felt that uh, I wasn't doing drugs, I wasn't an alcoholic, I didn't drink, I wasn't beating her. I felt abandoned that um, she turned her back on relationships. So I was, I was fairly uh, jaded towards women, and my only intent now was I was thirty, I was thirty-three, and I told my friends I'm going to date. Attempt to date every woman in America, if possible, and uh, just 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 goof off and 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 have a lot of fun. And again, it comes back to fun. And um, so I had saw this woman on MySpace who was a book fan, um, and she had a World of Warcraft background. So I sent her a, a friend request on MySpace, and I asked her out on a date, and uh, she said yes, of course. And uh, we met and hit it off. And uh, my plan to date every woman in America ended with her because. From our first night, we've been uh, never had a night apart. We're seven years together, married now, and uh, it's, it's it's pretty neat. But all because of you know nerd nerd stuff. Oh, well, nerd stuff's good. Um, I love gaming too. Uh, I love the communities. I know Antonio's yes. got a question. 
Yes. Uh, no. No. G going back to your to your decision to become a, a cop, have you ever reflect on that? You, uh, say, uh, what was make you decide to become? Uh, uh, no. Yes. And, uh, if you go back, is maybe this was not really what I should have chosen. Uh, have you ever, what you had to say about that? Well, when uh, when you're in interviews for law enforcement, they're going to ask you, why do you want to be a cop? The correct answer you are supposed to say is, I want to help my community or I want to serve my community. I never I never answered that way. I always knew why I wanted to be in the law enforcement. Um, I wanted to arrest every adult that was like my parents that did drugs that, that hit their kids so when they would ask me why do you want to be a cop it's like i want to arrest drug users and child abusers and then they would always be like that's not what you're supposed to say <laughs> um but that's that's why i got into law enforcement now um my it's interesting because people say well, wait a minute shane i knew you as a kid and you know your mom went to your little league games and they did these things and i said every moment wasn't poor i don't want to miss represented as if uh, every day I was being tied to a bed and, and shocked with a car battery or something like that. No, it was, um, I, I often use domestic violence. If you're, if a woman is married to a man and he beats her twice a year, but he buys her flowers and gets her gifts the other times, is that a, a good, healthy, successful relationship? Of course, the answer is no. And it was the same way with me um, growing mm -hmm. up. Um, and of course, yeah. the drugs are another side issue, but that was why I wanted to get into law enforcement was I wanted to, I wanted to save all the little Shane Moores um, that were out there. I wanted to find them and save them. And did you have the chance to, no, uh, after your choice, did you have the chance to talk with, with fellow, with fellow uh, people that are in, in, the, in the force about your story? And, you know, because I, I'm sure this is not something that happened to you. There's probably other people in the police force that had similar stories. Did you have the chance to, to talk about this and make them re reflect about their careers and, and the decisions that they, they have taken? Yes. In fact, one of my close friends um, ended his police career just recently um, and is now uh, working in the Department of Corrections inside, um, inside jail. Um, so he ended his street uh, career, um, you know, seeing, seeing how things are going and the change of the, the law enforcement uh, climate. Um, I have other friends still there, law enforcement officers. Um, in one of my novels, uh, The Apocalypse of Enoch, I destroy St. Louis with a zombie-based uh, apocalypse. I use the rapture as the trigger point at all the research, but every person in that book is a real person, um, which is actually how the reason that we're here, because I reached out to Kurt Yeager from Sons of Anarchy and wanted to see if he wanted to be in the novel as himself. So as an amputee, it created an amazing dynamic that you don't encounter or really see in any sort of apocalyptic world setting that um, is based on real life. And of course, Kurt said, hey, that sounds like it sounds like a lot of fun. So but that's how I and of course, you guys had interviewed Kurt. And that's how I met you guys. Kurt's an amazing, amazing guy. But, um, um, you know, so Artez uh, Harden is a St. Louis police officer that I made a character in the book. So if you read it and you read about Artez, he really is a police officer in real life. OK. Deborah, you had you had a comment. Yes, you know, Shane, uh, your story—it's so fascinating, and I I can't help but be touched by your emotion earlier too. And I um, I also grew up in a I had a very abusive childhood growing up, and lots of um, you know lots of really bad things happened to me and my brother and sisters when we were growing up. And it was, it was always a secret. You know, you keep those things a secret. And, and I thought about being a police officer when I was uh, a teenager because I just wanted to make a difference. And I, I went in a different direction, and I now focus on, you know, trying to really empower people with disabilities. But I, um, you know, my heart really goes out to you with your story. And, and I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of what you have accomplished and how you have figured out how to take control of your life. And I, um, you know, as a fellow American, it's, you know, our police officers, they, um, I think that a lot of times they do get a really bad bum rap. And now that we have videos, we get little snapshots of what we think the whole story is when we know there's a lot more to the story. And I know there's the problems and there's post-traumatic stress disorder and there's a lot of bad things that happen and um and there's a lot of different kind of people that are police officers but i just um 
I, I think your story will give people hope because you just don't know the walk that people are taking sometimes. And I look like just a very middle class, you know, typical American, but, uh, you know, how I grew up, it, it was it was really rough, and I um, now take care of my mother, and um, it's it's bringing back some of those childhood things that I I really needed to work through. So I'm actually walking through through some of that right now. So um, I just really commend you for having the courage to talk about this because it, it, you brought up gun control, the guns um, earlier, and uh, I travel often um, globally, and people are always like what's the deal with the guns and you Americans? And it's like, well, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's more than the guns. I think it's the, the, the trauma, you know, like even Neil pointing out what happened to him. I had never heard that story. That's a pretty traumatic story, you know? And so learning to work through that and, and understanding how to, um, I don't know, get, I, I always tell my kids, um, Sometimes you just got to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, but, but it's a very interesting story. So I, I just wanted to applaud you for that. Well, um, the issue right now with law enforcement, it really, I think, would occur regardless of a Ferguson, regardless of Freddie Gray in New York. It really, law enforcement, the, the opinions are a reflection of a global not just America, but really a global a population that has awoken politically. No time in the history of human have we had the internet, have we had the ability to chat with other people or anyone or everyone to express um, our, our opinions. The problem with law enforcement is that the public no longer trusts law enforcement because law enforcement represents the government. But should they have ever trusted law enforcement in the first place? And that's the interesting thing. So now we have a public that has awoken but has no education on why they should or shouldn't trust law enforcement. I can watch just about every police video that's posted online. It says, oh, officer did this or officer did that. And I can point out what training they've had, why they acted and the method in which they acted, and what prior incident that has occurred to cause them to escalate to violence so rapidly. Um, it, we're all humans. It's not that difficult to point out. Um, but a lot of public ignorance. Why didn't he shoot him in the arm? They don't understand that a firearm is lethal force. It is not. It is not used to incapacitate someone. It is not used for any other method. I'm sorry, not incapacitate them to uh, um, uh, incapacitate them in a harmless manner. Lethal force is designed exactly what its title is: lethal force. It's designed when no other use of force or option can be used. And, and a lot of people say, "Well." Okay, let's use the uh, Wilson Brown case, which sparked Ferguson. Okay, now I'm not—I didn't study the case, so I can't. I'm not going to dump into the privy of the details. But the simple fact that if punching an officer causes him to lose consciousness, then you have, under Supreme Court rules, you have incapacitated officer means that a suspect has uh, has control of the officer's weapon. That is a lethal force situation. So anytime you're dealing with police, you can't anything you would do that would incapacitate them immediately jumps the level of force for their safety to the lethal force. Um, but the public doesn't understand that. So the public thinks, well, he shot him seven times. One bullet will kill, 100 bullets will kill. The number of shots is unimportant. So the distance is unimportant. If you look at cases where an officer was attempted to be disarmed, and if the officer was successful in defending that disarm, and then the suspect tries a second time. Almost always the suspect is successful the second time in disarming the officer. And of those cases, the overwhelming amount, the officer is shot with his own weapon or has it used against him or her. So that's why when you attempt to disarm an officer and the, uh, and the officer pull, the sidearm is out, you've disarmed and failed, and the officer gives you verbal commands, any advancement towards that officer in any aggressive motion is justifiable lethal force. And the problem is, in America, the American citizens, we know if an officer pulls me over, I know I'm not going to kill him, but he or she does not. So we have a massive disconnect between law enforcement and the things they've experienced and the public, that 99.9% .9 of the public are good law-abiding citizens. We have this disconnect. I don't understand why, if I'm a citizen, I, have no, I don't understand why the officer is angry. Well, the anger response is not is purely off, uh, purely off of fear. I'm angry when I fear. Uh, when you were attacked, Neil, in the in the um, in, in, in the in the store, right, and yeah. a group hosted you, um, there probably was a level of anger um, that went that that you had to deal with personally. 
and then after being struck, and then after being struck, um, there's probably a lot of confusion. I'm sure. Usually, typically, that knocks someone out when they're struck with the bottle. But oh no, I got up um, and I w went to chase after them, and then I right. felt some warm blood. And, yep. and there's blood everywhere, and it's like right. so, so I so stopped. So uh, and and ended up getting all stitched up instead. Right. But Road rage. Good plan. Road rage. Road rage is a response. It's an anger yeah. response. And why are but, we angry? But I was, I was, until such point as I noticed. Right. Because it didn't hurt at the time. Sure. Yeah, the adrenal. Yeah, your adrenaline's yeah. going. You're, you're you're fighting a tiger for your life. You know. Yeah. So, it was only it was only when I noticed and and I sort of took a step back because I was ready to do do what mm -hmm. you were doing, chase down the street right. and sure. The, right. Living Jesus, but um. Right. Well, and seeing that's an anger response, road rage. Yeah. If someone's driving yeah, too absolutely. close to the rear end, why does that make us angry? Well, it's because it's dangerous. And our response to fear is, is anger. Anger saves us. Anger keeps us alive. It's a very basic uh, human response. If a lion is attacking us, very futilely, but we have to try to fight the lion to get free, to escape. Um, so, that, so when you see an officer that escalates rapidly to anger, nine out of ten times, probably even more than that, it is a response to fear. That's where the anger comes from. And that's where poor decisions come from um, on both sides. So um, the a law enforcement issue is really built around uh, fear. Why is the officer mad? I reached in my car. I'm just getting my driver's license. Well, how many times has the officer responded or had a, 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 another officer shot and killed when someone reached in? So now fear goes up. So now anger goes up. But the citizen has no idea why. Why are you so mad? Why are you doing this? Oh, you're being ridiculous, officer. I don't have to listen to you. Well, now the officers, through experience, training and experience, have learned that if you are not compliant, you are dangerous. When you are not compliant, you represent a threat to my life as a police officer. So now I have to navigate. How do I deal with you appropriately and, and keep my level of force when I'm fearful for my life all at the same time? And this is the, this is the challenge that we have. Um, I, think, uh, I think the force continuum, I think all of this should be taught in school along with your rights. Just because knowing your rights doesn't mean that you know how to interact with other humans that, that, that are, you know, are, are tasked with collectively representing um, our society and, and the laws and stuff that we want to do. And there's no easy answers, right. um, but there's definitely things that steps that we can move towards it. Another thing, too, is the officers involved in violence, a use of force. We have to get those guys off the street. We have to get them uh, downtime. You know, we have to get them where, and then do a psyche eval on them. And it sounds terrible. But it is my contention that this is how we begin to eliminate um, uh, uh, problems with use of force. So, Shane, going going to um, on that particular um, topic. So, one thing we want to make sure we cover in this interview, we want to talk a little bit more about your books. And so, yeah. it sounds like, well, my God, you're so fascinating. We could talk to you for you know the next couple of years. You are so fascinating, and I'm definitely buying your books now. So, um, <laughs> but tell us, tell us more because we know that obviously we have major mental health problems in the U.S. and globally. But tell us more about how you used writing and some of your books to to deal with some of the mental health issues that the real things that you were dealing with because I think our I think our audience would be very, very interested in learning more about your writing. Well, my uh, my first book I wrote was called A Prisoner's Welcome. It was too long. It, the chapters were too long. There was too many point of view characters. Everything that the literary industry would say is bad, uh, I essentially put in the books. Um, I had purple prose. Uh, you ever heard of overacting? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, my first book was overwriting. I was trying to be a better writer than I was. But my story construct was, was powerful. Uh, my characters, I didn't have uh, Dark Raven or, or The Black Knight. Um, that's very cliche. Never in my experience as a law enforcement officer have I ever arrested a villain that didn't like chocolate chip cookies, that didn't love their mothers, that didn't buy their girlfriend flowers. They're, they did None of the villains I arrested in law enforcement lived in a castle and surrounded themselves with black robes and and black roses and liked dead things. It's, um, you know, it just doesn't, it, it, that's not realistic. So my villains in my Abyss Walker series um, were very realistic. And that really what helped drive me um, towards my initial success. My Abyss Walker series is now large. I have four or five franchise writers, depending on uh, if you count short stories or not, in the Abyss Walker world. 
um, I have uh, the core series. There is um, a spin-off series called The Where Rats Tale, another one called White Wraith, and it's all in the same world setting. So essentially, if the Abyss Walker world is kind of like the Star Wars world, except for it's not as popular and it's fantasy. And, and I did it instead of George Lucas. So I have okay. franchise writers that write in there. Um, the book White Wraith is a, a metaphoric value of my life as a child um, in a fantasy setting where the main character is a minotaur who's born white instead of brown and black. Of course, I was born red instead of, uh, or you know, native instead of um, a white. And um, it's a really, very small, quick, easy read. Um, but that's, that's my favorite fantasy book that I've ever done. Um, it's taken off. I've recently signed um, a seven-book deal with Trollor Games. Trollor Games uh, partnered with the man who invented Dungeons & Dragons, Gary Gygax, who is also known, kind of known as Tolkien's the grandfather of fantasy. Gary Gygax is the, is the father of it, uh, you know, because he took a lot of uh, the ideas in the fantasy world that Tolkien made popular and made it popular through gaming and really is responsible for spreading it throughout um, our society now. So Gary Gygax partnered with Trollord Games, and they signed me for a seven-book deal to turn my Abyss Walker world into a uh, tabletop fantasy setting. Now, what's interesting about that, um, and I'll go back to when I was a kid. When I was 10 years old, I developed a psychological tick, tick to cope with uh, the abuse I was suffering in the home, and I would hum, and I would go, hmm, hmm, and I'd do it every couple of minutes, and I had no idea I was doing it. Of course, it was very annoying to my parents and <laughs> caused other interactions between us. Um, and at age 10, um, I contemplated either killing myself or killing my stepfather. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it, but I was so miserable. I mean, not to get into a long tangent on why that didn't happen as a 10 year old, clearly those aren't good choices, but, no. um, uh, I got a copy, uh, a box set of Dungeons and Dragons, um, for Christmas and, um, I played it. And so instead of being an abused kid, um, I was a wizard or a hero or a king or a knight and it created a world in which I could escape it. So really, I attribute that to saving my life uh, when I was 10 in 1985. Um, and um, that now it's become full circle. Now Dungeons and Dragons signed, not Dungeons and Dragons rather, but the guy who invented it, um, his company, Trollor Games. And of course, Gary Gygax passed away in 2008, but his company signed a contract with me to turn my tabletop game um, into a, a, or my books rather, into a tabletop game. So it's, it's full so circle. Cool. So it's, Really yeah. exciting. That was of all the contracts and successes I've ever had. When I signed that deal, uh, that was the moment that I went, this, this is something. Um, and it's really, um, it's not the biggest deal that I've done, but it was uh, was very important to me. Most meaningful. Yes. 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 That's amazing, Shane. Wow. Um, one thing that we want to do, we, we definitely want to make sure that um, our audience has a link to your website and your Facebook page and stuff so that, because um, I now am going to buy your books. So, um, and I'll start with your favorite. <laughs> oh, White Wraith? Well, the easiest way to go is um, if you go to Amazon and you type in Shane Moore, and it should have an author page. It will list all the projects and stuff that I worked on that are for sale. That's the easiest way. Um, it solves the hit and miss of what book story carries this and carries that. Um, so that's it's usually the easiest way. And if you're an ebook reader, it's much in a, much much cheaper than going and buying a paper book. Now I'm a, still a firm believer in paper books, but we all know ebooks are going to be the future. Paper book will never disappear. Um, you can't sign a reader. Well, you can, but you know it, it's not that exciting. Um, so paper books will always exist, but they're going to transition probably from a mass market to the trade paper. You'll see them in novelty locations, not um, really businesses built around them. Um, and I could give another four-hour speech on why I'm right and why there's already evidence of that happening. <laughs> no, we. Oh, I think that we are all on the same page with yeah, you there. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, um, my website is shanemorepresents.com, um, and it, um, it's all in Word. It's going to, I'm going to be moving hosting soon for it, so it may be down. It's not down now, but it may be down sometime in the future, uh, but it will only be down briefly. Um, to give you an idea, um, we talk about success. Um, your viewers might not know exactly what my success is other than I write books. I uh, write for Toy Hunter for Travel Channel. I did um, Season 3, Episode 3. It's a reality show. Bird's Eye Entertainment did it. Travel Channel puts it out. I've done seven songs for Sony Wright Records and Universal, but not the actual music, but rather lyrics, because um, I'm just, I write words. <laughs> yeah. um, I've done comics, of course. I worked on a project that Kurt also, Kurt Yeager was involved with called uh, Vindicated Incorporated, 
It's a graphic novel by artist Gary Cassell from IDW, and it's about a, a, a veteran, an Afghan war veteran who's a, a, an amputee who comes home and discovers that there's corruption in local law enforcement, the Veterans Affairs, and this, uh, of course, our big rich evil villain that's essentially the Kingpin style. And he dons a ballistic vest and fights crime. Um, of course, I have all my novels. My Apocalypse of Enoch World is the bestseller at this time. And I use religion as a trigger point for a zombie apocalypse, so it's really creepy. And uh, it's a worldwide global event. Um, there's three books in that series. There's a franchise. I signed a franchise writer to do a spinoff called The Children of Enoch, so it's even creepier. Uh, that first book is called Dark Harvest. And I just signed two more franchise writers to do spinoffs, one called Everwinter. And essentially in this advanced apocalyptic world, Yellowstone has erupted and covers the, winter, the world in an ice age. And uh, in that series... And we've got orbs, the outbreak response battle suits. They're uh, think of mech warrior suits, but smaller. Um, and then they're fighting these giant hulking zombies. And then the other series is called Deep Water, and it's a bunch of people with boats surviving the zombie apocalypse world, all the same world setting, but surviving on the ocean and hitting strange ports and trying to get the supplies, fight off pirates trying to steal their 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 you know supplies and stuff like that. Um, so that's a lot of the stuff that I've done. I, um, when I first started writing, I needed to get booked at locations and they would always say, well, have your agent contacted us. And I didn't have an agent. So then when I would contact them and say, well, I don't have an agent, then they never cared. So I studied, um, in the entertainment industry, I studied Hugh Hefner, Stan Lee, Gene Simmons, Tila Tequila, and Evil Knievel were the top people that I studied and all for various reasons. Gene Simmons obviously sold rock and roll. He made being a rock star, um, wealthy. He made that um, he made that a good thing. Hugh Hefner sold sex without actually selling sex. We all know Playboy had nude images, but they weren't they weren't uh, overly sexual provocative images. They were uh, almost as if it were art in a way. Um, and then you look at um, uh, Tila Tequila. Tila Tequila became famous for being famous, essentially. Uh, back when MySpace, she really rose to fame through that. So I studied social. What did she do in social media? What applies to that? How can I apply it? And then I studied um, uh, Stan Lee, of course, because of comics. Interestingly enough, did you know Hugh Hefner was more interested in being a Stan Lee than he was Hugh Hefner? Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, that was not really his passion, but it kind of you you that taught me that you go where the money is. So if you're trying to, this is a business. So it ain't about just what you want to do; it's about what you can profit from it. Sure. And then lastly, I studied. Evil Knievel. And one of the things that Evil Knievel did was when he would have a show in Las Vegas, he would then reach out to the, the, the hotels and he would say, hey, I'm so-and-so, not himself, of course, and say, I want to get that Evil Knievel package you have to stay in the hotel room. I'm going to his show. And the hotel says, well, we don't have an Evil Knievel package. He says, oh, okay, well, I'll call him a hotel that does. And before long, the hotels were calling him saying, hey, you've got the, you know, we need to get on your, your Evil Knievel package because we don't want to be left in the dirt. So all the hotels, of course, jumped on board, and then they began promoting that they had the Evil Knievel packages, thus in turn promoted his show. So what I did was I created Steve Warwood. Now, Steve Warwood is a fake person. Uh, he worked for the Wilder Marketing Group, and uh, Wilder Marketing Group is a, is a, was fake. Um, and this, obviously, also, I want to let you guys know, it's the first time I've told this story in any public setting other than personal appearances. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm letting the cat out of the bag here for you guys. But okay. uh, so Warwood would send emails as my agent. And, of course, I'm booking it. And then everyone interests, oh, he's got an agent. He's legit. And they would start booking me. I was no different than I was before other than my fake personality made it legit. So I, Steve Warwood started booking me all over the place. And I began to pass up my peers. And they wanted Steve Warwood to represent them. Huh. Um, at the height, Steve Warwood booked Peter Mayhew, who was Chewbacca, at Gen Con in 2008. Now what makes that interesting is there was a big dispute between Lucasfilms and Gen Con LLC over the sale of Salacious Crumb. Now Salacious Crumb was a little, the little, um, uh, some, uh, jungle monkey, I forgot the name, Kaorian or something. Um, that was, uh, goes, he, 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 you know, in front of Jabba and Return of the Jedi. So Lucas donated that to Gen Con LLC to sell at an auction. Well, Gen Con sold it at the auction, and they kept 10%, which was their standard auction fee. Lucas says, I didn't donate for you to profit off of it. Lucas uh, And Gen Con says, well, we're sorry. This is, and I'm paraphrasing the, you know, the entire lawsuit. Essentially, they said, we're sorry, but it's our policy, so we're keeping the money. Turned into a big um, 
almost cursed there for you guys, a big PN match, and uh, over this amount of money, and it actually forced Gen Con in to file a Chapter 11. Well, in 2008 was in the middle of all this was going on. So Steve Warwood contacted Gen Con LLC and Lucasfilms and got both of those to agree to let Peter come to the event to promote me because he let me write him a basic character off of him as a person in my Abyss world. So I got Peter Mayhew book at Gen Con with me to promote the event in the, right in the middle of the height of the Lucasfilm Gen Con LLC. Oh, that's cool. So I wow. turned that company from Wilder Marketing Group into Abyss Walker Entertainment. It's a legit company now. You can Google it. We represent Power Rangers. Uh, we actually uh, represented the guy that um, was the voice actor of the character Salacious Crumb, which was from the lawsuit. We represent a lot of other voice actors and stuff, and we book them for talent. Uh, I have three booking agencies that represent the clients, um, including myself, of course. So I created the booking agency. I cashed in my police retirement. I bought one of my publishers. In 2008, Borders went bankrupt. When Borders went bankrupt, they put three of my five publishers at the time out of business. There's a long story on why that happened. Essentially, I won't get into the details of the industry other than I bought a publishing company, moved all my contracts there, ended the policy that would cause me to go bankrupt, and then I, I lost about – uh, speculate around three thousand dollars a month from sales to Barnes and Noble because I ended this policy. Then six months later, Barnes and Noble announced that they were closing twenty percent of their stores, which was about two hundred stores. So that could have hit me as well if I had had sent books there. Um, I got with my son and said he was fourteen at the time. I said, uh, or he was twelve at the time, and I said, what what books would you rather read a book on an ebook or a paper book? And he says, an ebook. I said, great. Go ask your kids at school. They all said ebook. That means in 10 years, they are my market base. So sure. I knew I had to get out of paper books for the most part. Um, so I built it off of that. And then um, I created a distribution company since I no longer was using Barnes & Noble. I sold my sports car, used that money to pay a college for some market research, and then created a distribution company to then sell. sell. And not just my books because I bought the publishing company. I published other guys like Sean Taylor from Gene Simmons Dominatrix. So I needed to sell all of these books. So I created a distribution company to sell those books. Had enough success, bought my sports car back. Um, it's being wrapped right now with another business that I bought. So now let's advance forward. So I know that um, I was losing about 50% of my ebook sales because of pirates, right? And the social climate, you go online, they don't even view themselves as thieves. So internet pirates, that's acceptable. So if it's acceptable in the culture, there's no way to change it. It, or, or a very long, difficult road to change it, and I knew I couldn't do it myself. So instead of falling the way of Polaroid, I knew that, and this was about four years ago, I had a 10-year window until ebooks essentially would become worthless. And they're not there yet, but they're working towards it's It's becoming more and more. They just don't have value to consumers. And I don't mean worthless as in they're not quality product. I mean just consumers do not value them to spend no, money. No, they'll become free books. Correct. So okay. – um, what I did was I began to then, I need to take the money I'm making now and, and invest these in the other avenues. So I bought, um, and I was doing very well, so I bought a tending and graphics company. Well, all of my writers need posters. They need banners. I need posters and banners. I need this and that. So I bought a company that makes all of those things, and it's called, uh, it was called Guardian Graphics. I rebranded it to Phoenix 5, which represents Phoenix being born out of the ashes anew. Yeah. Uh, it represents – the five represents my five companies that I now own. It also has some other symbolic meaning. But so I bought Phoenix 5. So now I'm doing contracts with all the writers. It also tints cars. So it has an income outside of what I'm doing. I'm diversified. It wraps vehicles. So I can do vehicle wraps. We can, it'll do uh, advertise. So my sports car that I sold, I'm actually wrapping it in an advertisement for Phoenix 5. And I recently bought a, a coffee shop. Um, oh, my God. I partnered with the wrong person every week. Uh, it didn't have to go under, but I recognized that this isn't going the way. I'm partnered with the, the wrong person. So I terminated that contract. I lost a little bit of money, but I will probably still invest in those kinds of businesses because I can support those with everything else. I can sell books in a coffee shop. I can do book signings in a coffee shop. Um, I can, if people come to get their car tinted, I can give them a free dinner and lunch at the coffee shop. So now 
I'm selling it, I'm offering a service that no other of my competitors are doing, but I can apply it to that. So this is really the business aspect at which I got involved with. And the neat thing is now if I never sell another penny from my books, if I make not one red cent from my books, I can still give them away for free to push my IP and make it stronger. Then I can sell gaming, book rights, film rights, and do all of those things. And if all of that fails, all the money I made is not lost because I own a tinning and graphics company and a coffee shop. Wow. So these so, are an so opportunity. I, so I, I have two very quick questions. One, are your books being translated? They are not at this time, but they will be soon. Um, so I can reach a global market. Uh, reach a global market. My focus right now, uh, my init, my focus right now really is audio books. I want to reach that market first. Yeah. Um, That's but, what I do. I draw uh, audio books. Um, right. And audio books are a big deal now, especially as our intention spans lessen. Now, the books, uh, my books are not translated, but I'm not opposed to if someone had a good, strong business proposal and approached me about that. I've recently um, signed with uh, Amazon EU, so they so the books will begin uh, soon to be available in all a aspects of the European Union, as opposed to just um, the English-speaking countries. Um, but at this time, there is nothing translated um, at this time. So, are, are you going to do, uh, do any type of public speaking over the next couple of months? I've done public speaking um, at the conventions and stuff like that. Um, there's uh, there's actually a, a group. I don't know if it counts as a union or a guild, but there's four just for public speakers. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I do the speeches for free and stuff. So I don't. In order to really travel and speak, I would you know you would need fees and stuff. And and I really don't like to charge just to inspire people. That fee seems disingenuous to me. I want to I wanted to be able to offer a product. Um, I'm not against it. I've done speeches at high schools. I usually charge if I have to go far like $500, um, or if they have to, if I have to travel, then they just fly me in and feed me. Um, and I've done speeches in Pennsylvania while in Pawpock. I've done speeches here in Illinois at high schools and stuff. Um, it's not the mainstay of what I do, but I'm certainly not opposed to it. Okay. Cool. Right. Um, we've not maintained discipline today. Um, we're about 20 minutes over. This is going to be like an extra long next. <laughs> It's been fantastically interesting. Um, yes, yeah, so, so interesting. We've just, let, yeah. we've just let it carry on rolling, but but we need to wrap up now. And um, We didn't get to touch on any exciting football stories. <laughs> <laughs> but I played, we'll, we'll I get played you back. back season's AAA. <laughs> uh, we'll get you back. I, 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 I think I think this may not be the last time we speak. Yes, anyway. Yes. Uh, Very so, impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. I'm just I'm in her. Story. Uh, so... Thank you once again, Shane Moore. Thank hey, you. thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having me.